This is my great grandfather. Uh, at any rate, John B. mustered out of the Civil War in the Illinois Regiment, returned to Illinois, single fellow, 27 years old or so, and uh, was bored stiff. So, as most young men had a tendency to do, he went west. And he had a friend with him, and the two of them palled around together, and uh, they got word that there was a gentleman bringing a large covered wagon train and a large herd of cattle coming up from Texas, bringing the cattle into Montana. And they also got word that this gentleman, his name was Nelson Story, he was looking for guards because they were about to enter hostile Indian territory and they felt they needed more protection than just the cowboys taking care of the, of the uh, cattle. The two of them hired on. All went reasonably well. They did have one little skirmish where they had to go steal back the cattle that the Indians had taken, but the, which they did successfully. At any rate, they got up to a place called Phil, Fort Phil Kearney. I don't know where that is. I have not a clue. Certainly not in Montana. But uh, at any rate, at that point, a general, what was his name, Carrington, stopped them and said, no, you may no, go no further because of the hostilities ahead of you. Uh, Nelson and his group uh, were camped about three miles from the fort itself, and uh, they waited for approximately two weeks for permission to continue. The permission did not come, and finally Nelson's story got all of his crew together and planned out what they were going to do. And what they basically he figured out that three miles uh, away from the fort, and if they left in the middle of the night, they could, in fact, th th this cavalry could no longer catch them. They'd, they'd be way too far ahead, which is exactly what they did. They traveled at night for several weeks with no particular problems with the Indians. If any of this sounds familiar, it's the story of Lonesome Dove. And that, and that John B. Catlin was part of that. At any rate, <clears throat> they uh, got to Bozeman, and uh, Nelson's story is credited, I believe, as one of the founders of Bozeman. John B. Catlin and his friend thought that they would continue west. They came through Missoula, discovered the Bitterroot Valley, liked it, thought quite a bit, you know, about maybe they could stay there. Well, but they kind of wanted to see Washington and Oregon, so they off they went. A couple of years later, they decided, no, you know, we've done all of this, but uh, the Bitterroot is the best place. So they, uh, they got their horses and got their stuff together and all of this, ready to come back to Montana. Got all ready to leave and Catlin's buddy said, no, I've just seen, changed my mind, I don't want to go. Well, all right, uh, John B., I don't think that, I think the buddy gave him the horse. So John B. left for Montana by himself with two horses. And frankly, in those days, I don't know that that was all that unusual. But uh, at any rate, someplace along the line, he, it was a beautiful uh, sunny afternoon and there was a lovely meadow and he decided that, you know, a nap wouldn't be a bad thing to do. So he kind of stabled the horses a little bit and uh, did have a very nice nap. Woke up in the middle of the afternoon and the horses were gone. Well, he immediately scrambled up to kind of a high spot where he could look out 
and he did notice the grump of one of the horses going through the woods. So after the horses he went, and uh, but as he got close enough, he realized that there was a horse thief taking them. So at any rate, <coughs> he decided he'd work his way around by, to the front of the horse thief and confront him that way, which he did. And of course, with guns drawn, uh, the horse thief surrendered immediately. So now John has his horses back, and he also has a horse thief. What do you do with a horse thief? Well, some probably would have shot him right then and there, but John was not of that type. So, they, uh, he, here he goes, he's got the two horses and the horse thief and himself trucking down the road, and eventually they got to another guy that that had three horses, one of which not very good. So they all conferred as to what to do with the horse thief, and they finally put him on the horse that wasn't very good and gave him a little bit of food and sent him on his way. Never to be heard from again, I guess, I don't know. Any rate, why, when he got back to the, to the bitter root, somehow or other in all of this, he dashed back to Indiana and married his girlfriend and brought her out to Montana. Whereupon they set up shop in the Stevensville. He bought the Stevensville Hotel, which was a two-story affair. There were ten rooms upstairs, rental rooms, as well as the uh, as well as the the main floor quarters for the Catlins, as well as a large kitchen, a large dining room, and a large living room. And uh, at any rate, this was a reasonably successful adventure, and Belle Catlin, John's wife, had a Chinese cook that was doing quite well, other than the fact that the Chinese cook didn't speak very much English. But uh, at any rate, why, uh, Belle Catlin decided that it was probably time for the Chinaman to learn how to build a cake. And so she took the Chinaman into the kitchen and got all of the, all the ingredients ready, took him out to the hen house, got the eggs, brought the eggs in, and then she showed the Chinaman basically how you build a cake. Well, the problem was the first egg that she cracked open wasn't any good and she threw it away. So that was how you build a cake. And a few months or so later, she happened to go in the kitchen as the Chinaman was turning out really quite nice cakes, but she happened to notice that he was just starting one, and of course, he took the first egg, threw it away, and then built a hell of a good cake. But at any rate, uh, they, uh, they were there when Chief Joseph and the Nez Pierce came over uh, the Lolo Pass, John had mustered out of the Civil War as a captain, and he, in those days, was, uh, at any rate, the, the, the word got out that the Indians were coming and that the civilians and the whites were not going to be spared. It turns out in future history that the Indians wanted no part of the white man and certainly were not interested in burning anything or anything else, but the word, you know, the, 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 uh, the fear, if you will, was that not only were they going to kill all of the children and women and men and burn everything, but it was going to be just terrible and blah, blah, blah. So what happened is basically the women and children were taken to Fort Missoula, taken to Stevensville, Fort whatever it was there, and elsewhere, and the men, able-bodied, a good share of them were going to join the cavalry and protect themselves. It, uh, they hastily created something called Fort Fizzle. Those of you who know about Fort Fizzle, why, uh, at any rate, all Fort Fizzle was was a series of log structure wall, if you will, in a good spot up the Lolo Creek where they could confront the Indians 
and be protected by the log walls. Well, the Indians had a scout out front, as Indians are wont to do, I guess. At any rate, uh, they discovered the fort and went back and simply, simply took uh, another route. Went all the way around them. The, the cavalry and the civilians didn't have a clue. So it, we avoided that one. From there, the, the Indians went down the Bitterroot, or up the Bitterroot, whichever way you like it, over into the Big Hole. And there was the Battle of the Big Hole, which is not a terribly pleasant story from the white man's point of view. It, uh, it basically is a story that uh, the Indians, uh, uh, the, the, the cavalry and the volunteers found the encampment, which was across a small creek in the meadow, up on the hillside on the other side of the creek, the cavalry hid, decided that they would attack at first light, which they were ready to do. But at first light, one of the Indians came out of the teepee checking on horses, immediately discovered the cavalry. The cavalry immediately shot the Indian dead, and all hell broke loose because Obviously, they were all in their teepees and all of that, and so. But the cavalry and the civilians also had a four-foot-deep stream to cross before they got to the to the uh, encampment. There was a lot of uh, children and women killed in that raid. Uh, I have a rather lengthy description of that battle by John Catlin. Very, very difficult to read because of the, I think the ink smeared or whatever. But at any rate, he tells them that, look, they, we did shoot some of the women because they were shooting at us. But at any rate, neither that here nor there. Not a very pleasant part of the history of my great grandfather or any of the others that were involved. Once Joseph went on and, as you know, he went up the east side attempting to flee into Canada and almost made it. But the life back in, in uh, the Bitterroot returned to more or less normal, if there was such a thing in those days. And at uh, any rate, uh, John B. continued to run the hotel. He was involved in several other things that you, you're can find in, in the program. But uh, in later years, John moved and his wife moved back to Missoula. He was good friends with a lot of the very early day pioneers of this area, Judge Woody being one, Edgar Paxson, the, the artist, another. Paxson and Catlin were good buddies to the point where they spent a lot of time almost every day together, either at Paxson's place or at Catlin's place. My, you know, John's, Catlin's daughter, Belle, uh, wrote a wonderful narrative of John's life, et cetera, et cetera. And she was saying that, that uh, Catlin would go over to to uh, Paxson's studio and critique. And uh, my mother said, he had the audacity at this one point to point out to Cax Paxson that this large painting that he was working on uh, would look a lot better if that log that was in the front there, if it had a knot hole in it. Well, so Paxson painted the knot hole in it. At any rate, the two of them got along famously. And uh, that really is, is kind of the, my story as far as John B. Catlin. He is a, was a difficult, tough Indian fighter. And yet in later years, he, uh, I don't know whether I told you, 
he was a very staunch Republican in an area of Montana that there weren't many of. And at uh, <laughs> any rate, he, in later years, he was appointed to be the agent of the Blackfeet Indians. And the Blackfeet, if you, I'm sure you know, were one of the fiercest tribes in our whole area. And they were basically based up north of Great Falls in the area which would now be known as Browning or that general neighborhood. John and his wife went up north of Great Falls. They withstood it for two years. <laughs> How, I don't know. That's pretty desolate country up there. any rate, they came back to Missoula at that point, and he was appointed the receiver of the U.S. Land Office in Missoula, which he did for a number of years. He finally retired, and interestingly, some of his very best friends were the very Indians that he had fought earlier. And uh, his daughter tells a story of, you could always tell if any of the Indians had paid a visit to John's house or, or uh, Bell Catlin's house because the windows would all be open and they were trying to air the place out because the Indians, of course, smelled like the campfires that uh, were in their teepees, naturally. But at any rate, and likewise, uh, they had a little dog that did not care for Indians would growl and carry on at great length. One time, an Indian showed up and wanted to see John B. Catlin. Well, John B. Catlin wasn't home. So, the Indian said, I'll wait. Well, mid-morning went to afternoon. John B. still wasn't home. The Indian would not say anything other than a grunt occasionally. Wanted to see John B. Once finally John B. got home in the latter part of the afternoon, uh, the two of them met and the Indian left. Well, his wife wanted to know what was all that about. Well, John said, well, the Indian was broke and he needed to borrow a dollar to get home. So at any rate, that's, that's uh, <clears throat> at least while Bill Catlin uh, tells the story, they, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of hard to, to put all of this together. Again, I am quite blessed with my family. Both sides of my family have long uh, narratives of, of their families uh, several generations ago. In this case, it would be John B. Catlin's daughter that wrote all of this stuff. John B. also wrote a very lengthy, like I said, a very lengthy uh, story with regards his take of the Battle of the Big Hole. But, uh, and likewise, I have one from, from the coffee side of the family as well, <clears throat> which is kind of fun, you know. When you're young, you don't pay any attention to any of that sort of stuff. Who cares? Well, I put it in a box and eventually put it in a file and so on and so forth, and there it's been. But at any rate, why I got rooting around a couple of days ago thinking, you know, maybe it might be good to be able to tell a story or two. The, the factual part of all of this is in your program, and you don't need to be bothered with that by me. I'm on top of that, I'm liable to not tell the truth anyway. So, anyhow. That's kind of the story of John B. Catlin. 